Welcome. This is the discipleship cruise. The cruise that takes us across the gulf of lifestyles. That takes us from the bad side to the good side. That takes us from the negative side to the positive side. That takes us from the canal onto the spiritual. That takes us from the side of defeat to the side of victory. You are welcome. Today you have another opportunity again to join the cruise. As we go along, please, let's pray together so that God will help us. Father, you are the helper of the helpless. Lord, since we lost you through our forefather Adam in Genesis chapter 3, we need you to help us. Thank you for giving us another Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is now our captain and our leader. We are praying that your grace will help us to follow him very close so that we will, we will enter into everything that you have ordained for our life. Please give us understanding again in all spiritual insight and grant that Father we will be fruitful in your, in your vineyard. Thank you for again the opportunity to listen to you. Give us your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Life is a journey unto something. There is no aimless living. Even the atheists think that life is aimless. No. To live an aimless life that has no destination is a very, 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 very uh, unfortunate. Every man was born for a purpose and born again particularly for to fulfill that purpose. You cannot be born again and you are just going around in circles. There is a journey from Egypt to the promised inheritance. To go around mountains forever is not the will of God. So many of you must turn now and take your journey into your promised rest. God has a purpose for your life. You have a letter of appointment before you were born. God has already ordained you to be something. It is for that thing that God is training you. For everything we are going to do in life, God needs to train you. We have looked at this from different perspectives, from different sides. As we enter this ship of disciples, we need to understand that this ship is going somewhere and we need to understand the concept, the, the nature and the things that are involved so that we will make do a profitable journey. So, I want to go ahead. We have looked at discipleship. What is it? We have looked at the concepts, the nature, the conditions. As much as we can do on television, you need to be a disciple of Christ if you are going to become like Christ and if you are going to do the works of Christ. Say the works, the works, the works I do, the same works. And we are beginning to look at examples. We have seen the fishermen that Jesus said, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. We have not been exhaustive. I will see whether I can do a study on Peter and Jesus. But we began to look at Ruth last time and we shall continue because the story has not yet ended. So go to Luke chapter, Ruth chapter 1. The story of Ruth is a very interesting story of God, how God can turn his advantage into advantage. Eh? Some of us are born with some disadvantages. In Christ, those can be turned into something. Eh? Some of us are born with, with some people say bad luck. No, there's no bad luck with God. So let's look at that story of a lady who was born and was was by law never to enter the temple of God for ten generations how she became the great-grandmother of Jesus. And she's one of the few ladies you see in the genealogy of Jesus. God put her deliberately there to show you 
that no matter what your antecedents may be, no matter what your antecedents may be, God can turn everything around. We have seen the story of Ruth up to verse 12 of chapter 1. I hope you are following that story. We'll go again. I just read the last part of chapter 1. Ruth is a book of four chapters. I don't know that we'll be able to rush through all of it. But they are all very critical. Please learn to read and study the Bible for yourself. So in verse 18, the Bible says, When Ruth saw, I mean, sorry, when she saw that she determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And the woman said, Is this Naomi? But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara. But the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord had brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me. So Naomi returned, and Ruth, the Moabites, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. May the Lord add blessing to his word again. The point of entry into discipleship is a very critical point. If you don't enter discipleship properly, you do not go far. It's not a point to rush, not a point to cajole you, it's not a point to beg you. It's a point that you must deliberately put your neck in the yoke, not your leg. Say, take my yoke and learn. There are two daughters-in-law, Ruth and Opa, and Naomi is a great, great, great example of a good discipler. Discipleship itself is a very costly exercise. To have children is very costly. That's the simple truth. To carry human beings and bring them to maturity is very hard. Especially when it is the spiritual discipleship, where there is nothing to gain except God gives us his reward. But the simple truth is that at that point, there was no need to beg, there was no need to cajole, there was no need to make people promises of what they will get. They need to see what they are doing, they need to see where they are going, and they need to be to volunteer. And this entry point is not once and for all. At several stages in discipleship, the they give you a chance again to make your commitment and your consecrations and your dedications and to put your to, to renew your commitment. It's a going together. And and a good experienced skillful disciple will always allow you to it's always voluntary. They never force you. So I see when she, but it is a, when she saw that she was determined to go with her. Opa returned to her gods. Opa returned to her classmates. Opa returned to go and look for a husband. Opa returned to go and seek her interests. Mommy said no. I have had the explanation. But what I'm seeing, I'm seeing the visible. People that have no vision, visions, vision are see invisible, what others are not seeing, they will not go far in discipleship. If you are coming to discipleship, you will get a quick gain. There is no quick gain. You must see the invisible. You must see the reward. And the Bible said, Moses preferred chose to suffer than to enjoy. He preferred reproach to the treasures of it because he had respect to the recompense of reward. And this reward is not a temporary physical thing you get immediately. When you are going to school and you are going to spend six years studying architecture, studying medicine, and you are going to be an academic, you are going to be something, 
You know that it is going to happen many years after school, after you have gone to school. It's not immediately. You have to labor. You have to make investment before there's dividend. So when Naomi saw that this lady was determined, she stopped begging her to go back. She stopped entreating her to go back. Say no, no, no. She was begging her to go back. You see, you see, Naomi herself, and let me tell you the simple truth. You may not understand it. There are many times the person that is trying to carry you for God, herself, himself or herself, looks inadequate. When they look at where we are going, when they look at themselves, say, but how can I? But it's only by the grace of God. That's why Jesus remains the disciple. The human being is just an agent of Jesus. But that human being is very important. God will not live, do many things without parents. That's why he locates every child in a family. But in spiritual discipleship, you have to make up your mind to accept your parents. You have to make up your mind to go with your parents. You may not know the end result, but you must believe God. So Naomi herself is behaving as if to say, God, this is difficult. I would have liked to go alone. But since this lady has determined, there's a determination that you must express at the point of entry. If you don't, if you're not determined, and you are following somebody like Naomi or somebody like Elijah, you may, not, you may not go far because they will not encourage you at the beginning. Eh? And and when you are when you want to go far in discipleship, you don't need, you don't need anybody to be encouraging you at the beginning and, and giving you promises of what God will do for you. No, it's not needful. Make up your mind. Beg God to open your eyes to see what God wants to do with your life and what the path you must pass through to get into that place. So when Naomi saw that the lady could not be begged to go back, she stopped talking to her. Nineteen said, now the two of them went together until they came to Bethlehem. They went together. The two of them were going together. The discipleship is a going together. The discipleship involves teaching. The discipleship involves fellowship. It involves association. It involves going together. It involves sharing together. You see, it's a fellowship. Fellows in the same ship. We are in the ship. We are in a relationship. The discipleship relationship. There's a, it's not just teaching you. There's a going together. There's a learning that you cannot do when you are not going together. When there's no relationship. When there's no fellowship. If it's just a classroom teaching, it's like going to a former school. You can get your degree, but you have not, you, there's no transfer. There's no impartation. It's just mere knowledge you got. If there's going to be an impartation, if there's going to be a life transfer, they went together. They shared their life together. They ate together. They prayed together. They suffered together. They enjoy together. They laugh together. They work together. It's a, it's a going together. If discipleship will produce its result, that is how it should be. So in the New Testament, the Bible says, tells us that after the day of Pentecost, those who are baptized, they continue steadfastly in the apostles' teaching and in fellowship. When you remove fellowship, the result will not be salutary. And even if it's going to be good, it will take long when Jesus wanted to train 12 apostles, the Bible says he chose them to be with him, to remain with him, to associate with him. They woke up with him. They traveled with him. They were his apprentices. They understood him. Discipleship can start on a general note. Just learning Bible, learning Christ. But when it is going to produce a definite result, there must be a relationship between two people. The master and the servant. The teacher and the pupil. The father and the son. The master and the apprentice. He can answer different, different things. But there must be a relationship. It's not an equal relationship of equals. No. If you must learn, then you must humble yourself and submit. 
and submit to the conditions of Christ, even to the conditions of your disciple. This is very critical. This is very important. Sometimes before you set out, they have to tell you, no, you cannot follow me except you do this, do this, do this. It may not even be a biblical condition. When Paul was going to set out with Timothy, he took him and circumcised him. Then they circumcised a man who is 18, between 18 and 20 years. They don't, you don't, you have to submit to be circumcised. You have to open up. You have to, you have to undress. So friend, the critical entry point is a point where you must determine, a point where you must throw down your life. In consecration, it's a point where you must take the yoke of discipleship deliberately. And then you can go together. Elisha and Elijah, they went together. It is in the going together there's, that there's a transfer of life. Jesus wants to go together with you, but Jesus is not physically here on earth. So he, he, he takes a human being who is here and two of you go together. There are many things you can never learn just by reading the Bible. There are many things you can never enter just by reading the Bible. No. God did not ordain it so. There are many things you can never become in life except you obey your parents. There are many places you can never enter in life except somebody carries you into it. Can you imagine that Moses went into the mountain that was burning to go and meet with God because God said, come and be there. And as he took his sword and his back and was going. Joshua took his back from him and his rod, carrying it, because Joshua was his disciple that time. And because Joshua was carrying Moses back, he was given admittance into God's presence by the angels. And they spent 40 days and 40 nights, Moses did not eat. And because Moses was not eating, because Moses was not eating, Joshua didn't eat. So, when Joshua's classmates were still cracking bones and enjoying food, Joshua was already fasting for 40 days. Somebody carried him into it. There are some things you cannot enter into. Apart from your disciple is inspiring you, uh, stirring you, helping you. There are some things you can't enter except you climb on the shoulders. So this relationship, discipleship relationship, is very critical. As we look at other examples, we will discover that this relationship is important. If you have broken the yoke and you have cut the rope and you have no longer any relationship, you will be doing mere Bible study. Mere Bible study is not equal to discipleship. If you are going to become something, you must somebody must lead you into it. Somebody must carry you into it. And fortunately or unfortunately, you don't select that person by yourself. Nobody selected his father. Look at Naomi. They came to Bethlehem. Eh? They went until they came to Bethlehem. Two of them went together until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, all the city became excited when they saw Naomi. They didn't know that Naomi had lost her husband, lost her sons. And that this little girl with her was her daughter-in-law. And they were coming back together. And when the people say, is this Naomi? She must have grown older by it, at least 10 years. If you can imagine somebody you have not seen for 10 years, when you see her, maybe she is not having gray hair. And so on and so forth. Say, is this Naomi? Look at what she said. Don't, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Naomi means, Naomi means pleasant. Mara means bitter. Say, don't call me pleasant. Call me bitter. I'm bitter. Why? Because the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Eh? You know, I went away from here with two trailers of furniture, of goods. I went away full with a husband, with two sons. That's how we left this Bethlehem. Because there was no king. So we were doing what was good in our own eyes. So we left. Eh? And the Lord has brought me back home empty again. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has testified against me, the Lord, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me. That's how she saw it. Eh? The Lord has testified that I'm a foolish woman. He has afflicted me. Look at, look at how wretched I look. 
I'm coming back here. We don't know whether the house has fallen down. We don't know anything. We're just coming by faith. Don't come in, Naomi. Come in, man. And Ruth was hearing all this. Eh? And Ruth knows this story. And Ruth is still following this woman. She must believe in God. She must have faith that God will help her. You didn't choose your father. Your father may look wretched. Your father may be a drunkard. Your father may be a very poor man who does not know, who does not have handiwork. Your father may be a native doctor. Your father may be a, a womanizer. But that's your father. That's where God located you. And that will not spoil your becoming what you will become. Your father may be a Mara. Bitter. Not a Naomi. Not pleasant. Your home situation may not be wonderful. But God will bring you to the expected end. It is God that chooses who your father will be. You will make a great mistake to choose your father. Nobody does choose his father. God knows the person that he has chosen for you at every particular time to bring you where he's taking you. He may, he may give you someone else later, but for now, submit yourself to that person. Be obedient to that person. The person is not perfect. Let me inform you. The human agent, the human discipler is not a perfect person. Stop looking at his faults. Keep following him. There's a reason why God connected you with him at this particular time. There are some things in his life that God wants to inculcate in your life. Rebels and people that keep rebelling, they do not go far in discipleship. People that keep looking at and trying to find fault with their leaders, they don't normally go far in discipleship. They normally break the rope. And when you break the rope, you become unfortunate. You become an independent ranger. Friend, look at the person that carried Ruth into the purpose of God for her life. Look at her life. Dried, defeated, bitter. How can she help anybody? When she herself said, God has testified against me. I was very foolish. When my husband died, I could have left and come back. When my sons died, the first one I could have come back. I was foolish. But I left fool. I, I left here fool. I'm coming back with a cellophane bag. Reduced to nothing. I want to say to you, friend, that may be how you are seeing your disciple. Even your disciple will be saying, but there is nothing about me. Why, are you, why do you want to follow me? Don't worry. If it is God who says you follow this person, go on. You are going to get where you are going. I don't know what Ruth saw. I don't know the kind of thing that God did in the heart of Ruth to love Naomi so much. May the Lord do it in your heart. Because if God does not tie you to somebody, you may not be able to follow that person to the logical conclusion. There's a logical conclusion. There's a logical conclusion. If you don't get to the logical conclusion, it's a waste. And I say it is too costly. Relationships are costly. And when they don't conclude well, and they don't bring you into what you are following for, it's not, it's not good. So when you cut the rope prematurely and become a ranger, and don't become anything, and God has ordained that it is true Naomi that Ruth will enter where she's going. That's God's ordination. It's not man who ordained it so. And for every man, there is someone that God ordained that will carry you. He will climb on his shoulders. It may be a Naomi. If it's a Naomi that God ordained for you, please don't despise her. If you despise her, and you begin to also say many wrong things about her, you will defeat the purpose of God for your life. May God not let it be so. So Naomi returned. And Ruth the Moabites, can you imagine the way they Ruth the Moabites, her daughter-in-law, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. They returned. I pray that many of you will return. That God will give you grace to return. Many of you, you are not doing well. You are like a prodigal son. You are like a prodigal daughter in a far country. It is time to return. That prodigal son, the Bible says he came to himself. One day he came to himself. He had left home for some time. He had squandered everything. He came to himself. He came to his senses. 
He said, in my father's house, there are many servants who are eating well, and I'm here trying to eat with pigs. I will go back to my father. I will say, Father, please take me as a higher servant. Let me return to where I came from, to the father's house. They came back to Bethlehem, the city of David, where if they had lived there, who knows what Elimelech or Malion or Chilion could have become. But they returned anyhow. Two wretched women, two defeated women, two women looking at you say there is nothing about them. And I want to tell you, today they may look, it may look as if to say there is nothing about you. It may look as if to say there is nothing you can become. It may look as if to say you are the wretched of the earth. But I want to inform you, something good is going to happen to you. There is nobody who entered discipleship and followed Jesus who didn't become something. And the Bible said they came back to Bethlehem, to the place where God had located for them to be. And once you get there, God will take over your story. And the Lord is taking over your story from this moment. You, you, you. And the Bible said they came at the beginning of the barley harvest. Can I pray with you again? The barley harvest is about to begin. In fact, we are the, we are, we are the beginnings of the barley harvest. I have seen the first fruit of this coming revival, and all of us are going there. But you cannot enter this barley harvest on your own like that. It's the selfishness that brings you into the revival. You need your own personal revival before you can join the massive thing that God is about to do when He visits the earth. It doesn't look like it, but that's what God is going to do. And He's already doing it. Ruth is already in business. Can you buy your head? Even if you're a Moabites, even if you're an Ammonites, eh? no matter what they call you, they call Rehab a harlot. Up to today, today, they call her Rehab the harlot. But she's the mother of Boaz. What people call you is not the important matter. What matters is what God wants to make you. Can you turn your back on Moab? Can you turn your back on iniquity? Can you look towards your maker, your master, your Lord, Jesus? Can you surrender your life to him right away? And say, Lord, take me on. I have returned. I must be part of this harvest. Lord, thank you. Your word must not return to you void. You cannot return to you void. There are several lives I see now who are saying, Lord, I turn my back on Moab. I turn my back on evil. I turn my back on my past mistakes. I turn my back on my foolishnesses. I return to the city of David, to the city where Jesus is Lord. Lord, take it on from, from me and bring me to an expected end. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Reshes Media Center, number one, Refuge Close, on Gwambarde, Sabon Tashia Kaduna. Telephone numbers 0814-408-9412, 0805-845-5719. Email address threshesteam at yahoo.com or you could visit our website at www.threshesteam.org.ng.